Good morning and good afternoon to everyone for joining us today. I, I hope we have everyone. I can't see uh, everyone on my screen right now, but wonderful to have you at the World Employment Confederation's conversations, wet conversations today on Rise of the Green Collars, How the Green Revolution Impacts Skills. So great to have everyone with us. Uh, before we get started, just a little reminder or a little uh, point of note that we are recording this session to be shared uh, at a later date for others who may not be attending. So just a little heads up for you all. The topic of the green transition has been a topic for a long time now, many years now, but it's really beginning to heat up and we're seeing that need for green skills as we you know, increasingly transition to new technologies and away from fossil fuels. But there's still, I, I personally have, and a lot of questions still involve, what is a green skill? What are we exactly looking for? And what do people need to shift to in order to fill many of these new roles for new industries, new jobs that, uh, that, that we're seeing uh, more and more? So today, we have two wonderful speakers to help inform us and enlighten us on this topic, and hopefully we walk away with a greater understanding. And first, I'd like to introduce Glenda Contini, who's the Senior Economist at the OECD and Head of the Skills Team, and Adam Hawkins, who is Head of Search and Staffing at LinkedIn for EMEA and LATAM. So I'd like to welcome you both. Thank you for, for joining this conversation. And just a little bit of a note, uh, recently in the past couple of months, the OECD has released their Assessing and Anticipating Skills for the Green Transition, and LinkedIn has released its Global Green Skills Report. So those are both uh, available online, but very happy to share them both with everyone here following this call. Uh, another little uh, housekeeping note, uh, during the presentations, we're going to begin with Glenda, then Adam. Please feel free to share questions in the chat as we move through the discussion. Following Adam, I'm going to open it up to questions and address those questions in the chat. So depending on how much time we have after the presentations, we'll get right into it and have some discussion and back and forth. So really looking forward to that. So before I hand it off to Glenda, um, as many of you know, today, negotiations are still ongoing in Dubai at COP28 and now trying to come up with the final statement language that will help move us forward. Um, as they do that, it's been um, a very eventful couple of weeks in Dubai, and more than just negotiators there, we have many other actors, environmentalists, NGOs, companies, and yes, staffing agencies. And we've had people there from the WEC family and looking at those opportunities as we move again, like uh, I already mentioned, transitioning increasingly to uh, green economies, green industries, there's a need for skills, there's a need for workers and trying to establish what those skills are in helping to, and to, to quote Denny here, to, to skill, upskill, cross skill, how many different skilling schemes there are, but these people need those right tools, those uh, skills themselves to move into these jobs and to fill those labor gaps. So hopefully again today from Glenda and from Adam, we're gonna get a better idea of what, what gaps still exist, what is needed, and what kind of skills we're looking at to fill for the today and for the future. So you've heard enough from me. I'm going to zip it. And I would like to give the floor to Glenda. Glenda, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. And thank you for inviting me here. Let me just uh, pull up my presentation. Which uh, uh, you should see. Sorry, my system is a bit slow today, but you should soon see it properly. Um, here it is. So as, uh, as Andrew said, we have just issued a report on assessing and anticipating skill needs for the green transition, but I'll try and be a bit broader today because we do have uh, other pieces of work that are ongoing and from which I can anticipate uh, uh, some findings. Uh, Andrew's already set the scene in a, in a way uh, on the green transformation, but uh, I would like green transition, but I would like to remind everybody, and I'm sure we're all aware of this, that this is only one part of the many transitions that we are living these days, including, you know, the digital transition, including, in any cases, uh, developments in terms of globalization, in some cases, developments in terms of reshoring after the uh, pandemic. Uh, we are seeing also the demographic clock that continues ticking, despite the fact that we are not discussing that uh, aspect of uh, that, that, that uh, 
democratic the transition as much as the other uh, as the other uh, big transformations and what's uh, happening as a result is that uh, climate change and the mitigation policies that are resulting from climate change are affecting um, the jobs of the future they're affecting the number they're affecting what jobs but they're also affecting the content and here we go directly to the aspect of skills and how you know skill needs might be changing as a result of the green transition in combination of all of the other uh, trends. Now, um, uh, the the work that we are doing uh, is on three fronts. So at the OECD, so the first front is uh, um, looking at how skill needs are changing as a result uh, of the green transition. Uh, and uh, we are working on an employment outlook for those of you who knows, this is one of the uh, flagship publications of the OECD, which comes out every year, uh, um, more or less before the summer. And so we're working on one that is entirely dedicated to green uh, and uh, it's coming out in uh, 2024, probably June, beginning of July 2024. And we're writing a chapter on skills uh, in that um in that publication and then there is the work on skills assessment and anticipation that Andrew mentioned then we're also looking at training so we're looking at the adequacy of training for the green transition we're increasingly hearing from employers that they are lacking the skills that are needed from the green uh, transition so this is just a collection of articles but there are hundreds uh, not only there are uh, uh, issues related to the skills required to for the adoption of AI so relating to the adoption of digital technologies, but the green transitions having now a very similar effect. And in addition, we are hearing uh, from employers that there is a difficulty in identifying training that incorporates elements that are relevant to uh, the green transition. And we are, for that reason, looking at the training content in, in a number of, uh, of countries, uh, scanning that content and looking at whether uh, elements of green uh, relevant to the green transition have been uh, incorporated. Now, um, the, the, there's no green transition uh, without the right skills, uh, and uh, we know that uh, there is also no just a transition without the right skills. In fact, uh, the, um, the effect of the green transition, and you all know that probably from uh, many different studies, is very likely to be unequal. Uh, so we know, for example, that policies aimed at reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions will lead to reallocation across sectors. Uh, so for example, among the losers, you see in this chart, the big losers, there's going to be uh, sectors like fossil fuel extraction and distribution, fossil fuel powered electricity. And then on the other hand, the big gains uh, in sectors such as renewable and nuclear uh, energy. Uh, there's a uh, there's also the effect is also not going to be the same everywhere and for everyone so our work shows that workers in green driven jobs so jobs that are growing as a result or changing tasks as a result of the green transition tend to be male they tend to be prime age and they tend to be in a rural area so job creation is male job destruction is also male but that creates a still a gender bias because job creation remains a male dominated and uh, job destruction is also happening in rural areas because a lot of the industries that I mentioned before are located in rural areas, but they're not the same rural areas where, uh, where employment is growing as a result of the green transition. So important elements also in terms of uh, geographic uh, reallocation. Uh, so as I said, we are doing some work specifically on skills. We always say, well, particularly in my team, because I lead the work on skills analysis and policies, uh, but in general across the OECD, the message is really uh, now, let's focus on skills. Let's not uh, uh, you know, focus on occupations, on experience, on qualification. Let's go down to really uh, the components, the, element, the key elements of uh, uh, or required to facilitate transition. So we are looking for the employment outlook at comparing uh, uh, and look at uh, green related occupations. So these are the occupations growing or changing, uh, changing in terms of task content as a result of the green transition. And what we see is that uh, um, process skills such as critical thinking, active listening, monitoring are among uh, the most uh, required in green uh, related occupations, both in existing green jobs and in new emerging green uh, jobs. 
Uh, now, another interesting fact is when we compare uh, uh, new green jobs, so the green jobs that are emerging, new occupations related to green jobs, they are very focused on scientific content. So uh, we've been saying that for a while, that there are shortages of STEM skills. Well, it looks like the green transition is growing to accentuate those shortages. So, for example, new green jobs require skills like mathematics, engineering and technology, computers and electronics, while existing green jobs were more uh, required more uh, social skills, uh, software skills like customer and personal service, education and training and, and so on. Another interesting element is uh, when we compare uh, uh, green jobs to jobs that are not green, so that are neither brown, uh, neither uh, neither brown nor green. So they are uh, and brown jobs for us are jobs in uh, high polluting industries. So when we look at this comparison uh, with a view uh, of saying something about the transitions required, we look at these comparisons by. Uh, qualification level, qualification requirement. So we assume that people who are low qualified or, or are in jobs that require low qualification will still transition to jobs that are similar in terms of qualification requirements. So, and, and similarly for the high qualified towards jobs that are high qualified. So if we look within these broad requirements, we see that for the high skill, the transition is gonna be quite smooth. So in fact, we see a relatively smooth, uh, uh, a relatively good, uh, um, let's say, uh, co relatively consistent skill requirements at the high level between uh, non-green jobs and green jobs. But when we look at low skill jobs, jobs that require low qualification, the difference is quite important. So the, the green jobs uh, at relatively low level of qualification requirements require a lot more uh, system skills, uh, resource management skills, technical skills. And for us, although this is still a, a new result we'll put it into the employment outlook next year for for us this means you know that particular group of of adults who are already in the labor force will face a significant difficulties transitioning while unfortunately as it is also the case for other transitions those who are highly educated will probably have an easier life now, as I said, we're also we're not just looking ourselves at assessing what skill needs uh, are, how skill needs are changing, but we're also helping countries use the information that they are developing into policy making. Many countries uh, are uh, are uh, looking at their own uh, specific. Uh, uh, shortages and skill needs uh, for current and future, and then trying to use this information for policy making. What we find in general is that this is a relatively new endeavor. Until a few years ago, the green transition was pretty much related to, um, you know, the the technical ministries, so ministries of the environment, ministries related with, you know, making air quality better. It's only recently that the ministries of labor and the ministries of education have started uh, being concerned about what might be the implications in the labor market and as a result looking at how skills are, needs are changing how job creation and destruction might play out and as a result what policies we may want to put in place so uh, there's many different ways in which we can assess uh, how skill needs are changing um, and they have different scope and different methods uh, so they can cover for example the whole economy or a particular sector such as uh, clean energy um, and uh, given the impact of the green transition um, which extends beyond what we consider traditionally green and brown industry there's a benefit of course from having a whole of economy approach and generally, most of these exercises assess the skill needs now. They are very few that are looking into the future, really estimating uh, changing skill needs uh, in the future. Uh, you can have quantitative methods, which generally involve econometric projections, are done by statistical offices. Uh, they are based on, uh, on data, increasingly on online job vacancies. And I'm sure Adam will talk about uh, uh, data from uh, LinkedIn for the same purpose. And then you also have qualitative methods 
methods. And qualitative methods include rather foresight, consultation with employers um, and workshops, uh, for example. And they do have uh, some advantage because they allow better focusing on skills themselves rather than uh, on jobs and then translating the results on jobs uh, into, uh, into skills implications. And generally from our work, we consider that mixing the two methods is the best, uh, uh, the best approach. One key issue, one key challenge that we see countries are having uh, when uh, assessing the uh, the implications uh, of the green transition and also trying to translate them into policy messages are is coming up with. Uh, definitions so we find that uh, uh, despite our attempts uh, to uh, you know to 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 move away from a from a strict definition of what are green jobs or green uh, skills or green sectors uh, we always come back to that. The countries are asking us for help in understanding what to measure. So most countries are still taking an industry approach uh, and most uh, stakeholders within countries. But of course, uh, that's relatively narrow and overlooks uh, jobs that might be green, but in non-green industries. And the skills approach we find is the most uh, complex, but it also is probably the most promising because it allows us then to really discuss transitions based on the skills that individuals have and design training that addresses skill gaps. Um, now, the, the policy use is, uh, is quite a widespread. The idea is that this information on changing skill needs will need to be used in other learning policies to revise uh, course content, for example, allocate funding to training providers that are providing relevant training, uh, uh, designing training incentives for workers, uh, training trainers. There's also, of course, the element of uh, feeding into formal education for young people, for curricula, for steering uh, then uh, through career guidance choices, both of adults and youth. Um, steering employment uh, policies as well, like updating occupational standards, uh, designing incentives to increase uh, employment in, in growing sectors and setting priorities for the recognition of prior learning. And then to some extent also industrial policies and uh, migration uh, policies that go a bit beyond what my team in particular covers, but are still very important and uh, for, for the inform to act on the information on how skill needs are changing. Uh, there are some key takeaways from our studies that uh, uh, suggest that you know uh, planning for uh, for the um, uh, for the green transition is very important, and also for the measurement of how green skill uh, um, skill needs are changing. Mapping information on skill needs, uh, adopting common targets and shared definition. Very often we see that within the same countries we have many different definitions. You sometimes it's uh, some studies are sectoral, some studies are. Uh, national, others are regional, and then if you want to draw all the results together, it makes it very difficult. In terms of implementation, uh, we feel uh, really that targeted scope and methods are the most effective and that, of course, all stakeholders should be involved uh, from the start. And then, uh, uh, you know, in terms of implementation, um, the use of the results in policymaking is very important and uh, ensuring that there is a continuous uh, policy dialogue. And I'll come to my next slide just to give you some examples of how the information is being uh, used uh, um, in policymaking in some countries. So, uh, for example, uh, in Australia, uh, the uh, information that's produced uh, uh, by Jobs and Skills Australia, which is a public body that provides advice uh, on the labor market and uh, performs skills analysis and forecasting, is being used directly uh, to develop a new energy apprenticeship. So these are programs uh, that are aimed uh, at uh, addressing skill needs, particularly in the, uh, in the green uh, transition context. There's also uh, countries that are investing uh, in institutionalizing uh, the coordination of, of policymaking on green skills. For example, France with the observatory, the National Observatory of Jobs and Occupation in the Green Economy, uh, the uh, ONEMEC, uh, which brings, uh, which is government-led and brings together uh, a broad set of ministries, uh, the National Institute for Statistics, uh, public employment services, uh, research institutions, Institutions, employers, associations, and local authorities, 
uh, to, uh, let's say, overview skills analysis and disseminate information. And then another good example is the one in Norway, the Future Skill Needs Committee, which is now focusing on uh, green skills and which consists of researchers, government representatives and social partners. Uh, and its role is really to advise the government and social partners and provide the best possible uh, evidence-based assessment for uh, uh, Norway's future uh, skill needs. I'll stop here. You heard the possibly in the background some Christmas music playing outside in my street, but uh, I hope you could still hear what I was saying. Glenda, that's wonderful. I couldn't hear that music. That's lovely. We should keep that as a little soundtrack in the background. Um, Adam, if you have music, please feel free to play it as well during your presentation. But Glenda, thank you very much. I encourage everyone uh, to add your questions to the chat. And we're going to move on to Adam and please continue to do so. And I, my questions are filling up my page here, but I'm sure you don't want to just hear my questions. So please add them to the chat so we can uh, address them uh, following Adam's presentation. So Adam, you have the floor. Thank you, Andrew and Glenda. Uh, super insights. Uh, I also have loads of questions, uh, but but fascinating. And uh, to echo what Glenda said, thank you very much for the opportunity to to share this this most important topic. Andrew, as you mentioned, we've recently released a green skills report that's uh, available uh, on my platform, but also something Andrew is happy to share with you. So I'm going to share some of the headlines today. Um, the report is quite in depth. Uh, I think it's really fascinating in, in what we, we are seeing out there. Just to give context from a LinkedIn point of view, the the data points that you will, um, that, the, that the trends and the patterns are pulled from sit from our growing member base. So we now have a, over a billion members. Obviously we, we have a huge amount of organizations and we, we track skills and many things. So that will be the basis of, of, of the data set just for your reference point today. Um, before I get into the, the the presentation, I think that probably one thing for for us to be thinking about here, and, and I really like the way Glenda talked about the, the transitions, what we see today within uh, the labor market and the, the whole world of work, it's it's fast paced, it's infinitely complex. And, you know, as Glenda pointed out, there is various transitions out there, but they're also hyper connected as well. And that's also a challenge for organizations to uh, figure out not just how to prioritize, but also how to uh, connect the dots together as well. So when we talk about um, navigating the green skills, I'm, I'm going to give a lens from a, a recruitment or an agency point of view as well through through today and how not only re recruitment organizations and agencies um, can operate themselves, but most importantly, how they can advise the labor market and, and the customers themselves. At a top level, I would say, from our data point of view, we we see quite a lot of positive activity. So green job postings grow twice as fast as green talent out there. We see that people with green skills, and, and Glenda gave a, a good overview, and we'll give our take on that as well. But we're seeing that there's greater likelihood of success or hiring rates with green skills. Um, and actually, what you can see here on the right-hand side as well that the average job requirements that include uh, more than green skills is increased by 24%. So we're seeing really positive patterns in that. Um, there are there are some pros and cons to the conversation that I'll share with you. We also see that um, the demand for workers with green skills uh, will surpass supply by 2026. Um, a lot of people, and, and I will not be too controversial today, but I would say, and, and Glenda, I'd love your opinion in the sort of Q&A section, but what we tend to see is um, with any kind of transition is is terminology is super important. And what, what we're seeing is a lot of people are confusing green jobs and green skills. And that's something that I set out to share a, li a little bit more for you today. So I'm going to talk a bit about what a spectrum of green jobs is. The way we define it, and I'm sure like Glenda, you know, people have different categorizations of this. What you'll see in our report is we, we have really four definitions um, in the green skills category. Um, so I think it wouldn't be a surprise on the column around green jobs that they're roles that we easily relate to. I, I worked running recruitment businesses for many years and had engineering businesses and sustainability was about all moving to, you know, um, 
more sustainable services beyond oil and gas. And, and the roles that sat within those were, were pretty obvious, and you can see that on the list. What we look at today is like four categorizations. So you obviously have the, the obvious green jobs that have a multitude of green skills and can't be done without those green skills. Um, if, if you move down the spectrum, you have what we call greening jobs. Um, these are jobs that have uh, several um, green skills in those. They probably could be done uh, without those green skills, but invariably they're more than likely to become green jobs very, very soon. And then lower down or further away from the spectrum is you've got greening potential. So these are um, jobs that have what we see one skill or maybe two. They couldn't be done without those skills, but certainly they are like emerging green jobs. And then you have non-green. Now, I think all of the jobs that will um, be categorized will change over time. So at the moment, like a non-green job example would be potentially like a nurse um and a, a a greening potential job might be like an accountant for example but we're seeing you know and i'll talk about finance in a second but we're definitely seeing that roles like finance are you know having green skills within within them and i think you know we talk about a revolution i i think what i'm seeing right now is that there's a lot of talk around sustainability uh, and, and energy which is important however i see there's a huge uh, non-vocalized undercurrent going on which is this green skills revolution of so many jobs that are shifting um, we'll see most people's jobs shift by 65 percent skills in by 2030 and i think that's something for us to think about if you look at like the the, the jobs that are transitioning so you can see here of our members transitioning into green jobs um you can see here the types of areas that are more likely or less likely. Now, I think this, um, and I think Glenda alluded to this as well, I, th I think it's a bit of a moving feat, feat at the moment. I think things will absolutely change and this might look different over time, but this is definitely where we see it. So probably wouldn't surprise you. And I think there's some commonality with the things that, that Glenda brought to the forefront, but this is in the report. Um, and actually, Let's look at the the sort of the evolution um, themselves when we look at the green jobs. So we're seeing um, lots of jobs that are actually coming into these uh, different areas that that might surprise you. I mean, I'll give you a prime example. Um, I was speaking to an accountant the other day and they were saying, um, you know, my my job, it will become a green job. I have to report on um, net zero carbon emissions, etc. We have people um, that we've hired in our office that are office managers or facilities management roles, they have three or four green skills now within those. But ordinarily, you would not categorize those as a green job, but actually uh, the, the evolution or the revolution of the green skills agenda is is underway, and we can see that in our data. Um, and I think that's, if there's one thing I'm gonna leave you with today is that you know we do need to be looking at green skills and not jobs, but that is about work in general, the shift from, you know, function um, and education a way to skills and potential will be uh, the revolution of of how we hire attract and, and retain individuals um if i look from a, a global perspective i thought it just might be useful for you to, to have a look at some of um, these elements here so you can see here around the world only one in eight workers has one or more green skills but you know flip it the other way seven out of eight workers lack even a green skill um, but we have actually seen, you know, increased job uh, posting activity with green skills. So although the baseline is probably not where we want it to be, we are seeing positive activity that the demand is increasing and that falls in line with what I shared as well. Um, and you can see that the share of green talent is also increasing between that period and jobs requiring a green skill uh, also grew. So indications of demand are certainly there. Um, wouldn't surprise you that from an energy perspective that uh, we see positive growth specifically to renewable energy uh, industry. Um, there's more people leaving the joining. We're seeing patterns around Australia and UAE where, you know, you are seeing um, uh, workers enter uh, faster than exiting. Uh, when we look at US, UK, Germany, um, there are fewer workers within that fossil fuel industry. Um, than leaving, but the decline is decelerating. So I've tried to give you a view from um, all sorts of different sectors, but you, you know you compare the global uh, percentage of workers with green skills from economy wide to oil and glass at twenty one percent, 
But if you look at things like farming and construction, they're, they're specifically higher. So I think, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure whether Glenda will agree with this, but you know, you can look at any global transition topic, but you absolutely have to break it down geo and industry wide. And, and if we continue that conversation, again, this wouldn't surprise you with the amount of, um, you only have to drive down uh, a street these days to see the amount of vehicles that are now electric vehicles. Um, there is a whole industry around that. You know, you can think about lithium batteries. Um, those types of jobs now are becoming uh, greening jobs. And we can absolutely see that, you know, we are, are booming around the concentration in this industry, again, which is a positive sign. But it's the industries that support the industry. It's not just the making of electric vehicles. It's around um, transport, infrastructure. Um, it's about charging. Uh, all of these things are new skills that need to be built around this uh, transition. And if you look at um, the automotive industry as itself, um, if you look at um, the uh, electric vehicle skills, you can see um, the pattern of behavior month on month. And you can see that broken by um, country specific specifics. Again, that's in the report, but obviously uh, a very positive movement from a green skills point of view uh, at 62% between 2017 and 2023. Caveat, finance does lag behind um, the concentration, as I said, compared to the global levels at sort of 21%, you know, is at 12.3%. And, and in the financial services, you know, we're only looking at 6.8%. Um, but what we do see is that there is a pattern of positivity. So there is signs of momentum. I think we will see, as I referenced, many, many jobs that relate probably to data reporting, potentially even policy or regulation, um, accountancy that will start to move into, um, you know, jobs that have green skills, obviously because of the, the rate of policy change and regulation, that's going to require skills around that. So the momentum is there. And actually we've seen, you know, in a shorter period of time, um, you know, higher growth rates, which, which I think is positive for the outlook. If we think about the talent gap itself, <coughs> excuse me um from our analysis within the report you know we, we can definitely see there's a growth in demand of green skills um and it's outpacing uh other areas and like i said um if i were running a recruitment business or advising organizations you know the focus on green skills is is the area to play um but it's important that actually that the the talent gap that is emerging is is accelerating probably quicker than most organizations realize because as i said they're looking at traditional green jobs and they're not looking at the the four categories of of, of jobs that i talked about with the green skills piece and, and i think that will definitely become a pain point from 2026 and it's great andrew that we're having conversations like this as well um what's also interesting is, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we we have a green skills deficit uh, within the labor market. It's not a surprise. Uh, we have other skill deficits. And like I say, the amount of change of skills will radically advance. Uh, we will, even if we are not moving jobs, our job is moving on us. And that is all related to our skill evolution. And that comes from technology, but also transitions like this. But the indicators of, of skills and availability of talent versus posting activity, um, again, this is just another data point to validate that the demand is there, it's growing, um, but actually there is a deficit there. The other thing that we've seen as well, and um, I, I'm not going to go into too much around um, economics here, but what we definitely see is, um, you know, and we have this from a macro point of view, but we've also had it from a pandemic point of view. There are certain categories that are what we would call uh, economic or pandemic proof and certainly green skills is an area of resilience um, and we've seen that during times of economic uncertainty that actually well overall hiring has slowed or actually i would say maybe even normalized um, over the period of february 2020 to february 2023 job postings with one skill have grown so again there's a resilience and if again from a, a recruitment company perspective, in advising and building their businesses around practices of shortage and, and growth opportunities and advisory, this validates that that is the outlook. And then I'll come to just a, a final summary. So um, I've, I've sort of documented this from uh, two lenses. One, one is from a recruitment 
uh, perspective. Hopefully, um, the presentations today from myself and, and Glenda point that green skills are becoming increasingly important, I would say even critical with the demand of, of sustainability and responsibility. Um, we do have uh, a huge uh, skill gap, but equally we're seeing demand uh, grow twice as fast. Um, we've also seen the resilience and the hiring rate for workers with one green skill is higher than that, the average workforce. So if you are, or we are, or they are building green skills, your equity in the marketplace uh, will be relevant and in higher demand, which is what a lot of people need to be thinking about. And then, Andrew, just to bring this to, to a close before we move to questions, I think from a key part, finding point of view, um, within the report itself, and everybody will have the opportunity to read that, uh, employment in the renewal energy space and industry has grown in every country studied, which I think is an important uh, call out from the report. Um, we're seeing green skill growth across all industries, even in, um, carbon intensive industries like oil and gas as well, as they uh, evolve and refine um, uh, what they are doing. Um, equally said, the finance industry is lagging, um, but actually we're seeing an increase with the green talent concentration. And I think that comes, as I said, from regulation policy, but also the skills around um, auditing and accounting that we're definitely seeing. Um, and 81% um, of transitions into to green jobs workers uh, well, people already possess green skills and experience. So um, maybe a, a final sort of controversial statement is um, many people maybe don't even know they have green skills and um, they're not categorizing that correctly. And I think that's a lot to do with um, the systemic nature of the way uh, hiring is, is uh, traditionally done in the marketplace. I think uh, I'm one of the big advocates, and Denis knows this, around moving to a skills first agenda. I think this is also gonna help people understand what green skills and skills they have in general and what skills they're gonna need. Um, um, the other thing I would say is, and um, it's the final comment I would make, what we definitely see as well, this is not just around a candidate uh, and a posting point of view. We see more generations in the workforce uh, than we've ever seen. We've got five generations in, in the workforce Today, uh, if you look at um, the newer generations that have entered, you clearly see that purpose is a, a number one priority for them beyond uh, pay. Um, what we see with uh, functions like we've got on the platform, like commitments where companies can put on their career page, what are their um, uh, commitments to uh, their um, policy and their um, things like their social impact we see that um, huge traction around companies that are putting on things like sustainability, green and environment are very, very important from an attraction. We we can't uh, be remiss the fact that organ organizations need to understand that uh, applicants and potential employees are checking their company out before they're even aware of that. So the importance of like value proposition uh, and actually having a clear strategy around environment and sustainability and actually uh, communicating that authentically is important and, and is certainly important to uh, newer generations that don't need a company to give them purpose, but um, help align with their existing purpose. So, Andrew, I will bring that to a stop, a bit of a whistle stop tour from a very thorough report, um, but I also want to make sure that um, the audience have time for questions as well. Adam, thank you very much. And whistle stop. We, we could be here for hours talking about this. And unfortunately, we only have one hour, but uh, fantastic presentation. And Glenda, thank you again for yours. Um, I, I'm going to start us off with a question. It's burning in my mind. And that's a great question in the chat that I'd like to get to. And maybe this segues. But um, looking at one of your graphs, Adam, you were showing from the country perspective when it came with EV skills. I'm Canadian, so I'm going to call out the country I'm from. And, and Glenda, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to call out any nations in this. But um, getting to a point here, but uh, a recent development in Canada is a big new EV plant. It has been approved, it will be built, but they do not have the workers with the skills to get that plant up and running. So they're going to bring in over a thousand foreign workers from South Korea to get that up. It's become a political issue. And I guess my question in this, it's well, a two-part question. One that ends up being a bit of chicken and egg. Of when do you skill the people? Because the jobs and the opportunities can arrive in an instant. 
and not be prepared for that. But at the same time, to get the political will on board to invest in skilling before there may be an opportunity in front of people to, to grasp onto, what more can be done to convince or encourage uh, countries and companies to make that investment when maybe there is no sure need for it in the immediate future, even though we're seeing the skill gap everywhere. But I'm sure there's this, okay, when do we make that investment? Do we do it now or do we wait till there's something concrete? Uh, maybe Glenda, I'll start with you on that and then to Adam. Well, I think that's a, <clears throat> that's an issue that we're facing with the green transition, but also with other uh, other big transitions, right? I've heard exactly the same argument in South Africa, who are having this challenge because they are relying uh, a lot on migration in their shortage when they have uh, occupations in a high shortage, but they are facing this, uh, you know. Uh, um, these um, you know conflict between uh, between employers who are saying they are facing shortages, so they need the migrants uh, and the unions, the workers' representatives who claim you know that uh, there are workers in the country. I mean, I, I'd like to just bring up perhaps uh, something very briefly that Adam was saying, uh, and that uh, we may think that there aren't workers with exactly the right skills, but very often it's a result of looking at their experience, looking at their qualifications, and not focusing on the actual skills they possess. And uh, as a result of that, so of not using this skill, skills first approach, as Adam was calling it, we are also uh, thinking that you know the retraining effort is a lot bigger than it actually is. So you could. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not uh, prepared to say whether really you need the Korean migrants uh, to to uh, uh, to work on the new plants. But uh, I think uh, it, it is worth, uh, uh, I mean, to, to, to be able to address the shortages in a more constructive way, you need to be able to look at uh, what skills are available in the country beyond the qualifications uh, and have a training that addresses skill gaps rather than put putting people through an entirely new qualification. And I think through that, you would find that perhaps uh, the shortages will stay to some extent, and to some extent, you will need to rely on migration. But I think you will probably find that the talent pool that already exists in the country uh, can be expanded by, by taking this uh, skills first approach. As Adam was saying, you know, generally, employers are only thinking of uh, people who are labeled already as, you know, fully qualified uh, with green skills and so on. But some of those skills may be, may be there for others or with a relatively uh, short uh, retraining effort. Adam, your thoughts? Yeah, well, I'm not sure I can solve your um, Canadian issue, uh, Andrew, <laughs> but what, what I would say is it, it's a great loaded question. Um, I, I think... There is a mindset shift within organizations, whether that's um, education, government, but but also companies. Um, historically, we've had a resource where we can fill jobs, right? When we have a demand, we fill jobs. Um, and I've been on enough um, WEC calls to know that the one thing that always comes up is, you know, labor shortages, skill shortages. Like, so... That's that's obvious, right? That we're always whether that's around electric vehicle plants and stuff like that. Um, there just isn't the right skills, and we're also seeing skills evolve. I think the first thing that um, needs to be addressed is we need to stop thinking about filling jobs and actually putting people to work. And what that means is, do you understand the skills you have in your business today? And I don't just mean breaking down your resume or your profile. I'm actually saying. Can you really quantify your hard and soft skills? Um, but also, do you understand adjacent skills? So, you know, we've seen various obvious examples where, um, you know, through the pandemic, you know, hospitality workers were disproportionately affected. Um, but you saw a huge surge because we were all at home and we couldn't meet people in contact center. You know, you, you would look at our data, and I've shared this with Denis, you, mean, you, you have a 92% skill match of adjacent skills on that. But nobody was looking at that beyond the silo that they have. So I think the first thing is, once you know what skills you have, and most importantly, you know, projection of demand, um, then you hire benches, and you build benches, and you build talent pools, and then you're assigned people to work. And also, you'll see that 
you know, certainly the younger generations want to transition more as well. So actually moving your organization to a more project-based uh, uh, structure is also useful. I think the other thing is once you know um, around, you know, and, and this isn't just around, you know, green skills, it's about all skills. Once you understand the future demands of your business and you can assess skills in the business and adjacent skills, um, how are you kind of almost building the new systemic HR structure where talent acquisition um, and uh, training come together to actually bridge those gaps quite quickly? I think that needs to be deconstructed. I think pace setter organizations are starting to think about, you know, building their own reskilling, upskilling. Um, the, the final thing I would say is, um, you know, and, and I think Glenda was looking at this as well, maybe that talent exists in your business and you don't already know, but it's not the obvious fit. Um, how do you mobilize talent around your organization? Also, how do you um, reskill individuals? I mean, we talk a lot about skill shortages, but in most, well, we talk about the aging transition, which Glenda had on the, the top of, of her scale. Um, that's the one seg segment, Andrew, that it's growing, right? But actually they're leaving the workforce. So how could you start training those individuals, you know, into the demand areas of the business? And, and I think that goes back to uh, modernizing the HR structures, practices and, and mindset. Yeah, I'm going to shift to the a question in the chat here. And I really like this. Then the two questions we have, the first one, taking a gendered approach to this and, and we've already mentioned from transitioning from these brown industries and brown skills, it's very male dominated. And there's a lot of discussion about the reskilling of men into new industries. But from a gendered approach, from a DEI perspective, and then we, I know we don't want to talk about the jobs per se. We want to look at the skills, but we also want people to be attracted to the roles in which their skills fit. So maybe, uh, Glenn, if you could maybe take a crack at this first from the DEI perspective when it comes to ethnicity, gender, and the education part of this, is there a focus there to be really looking at uh, maybe underrepresented demographics to where people may have those skills to fill this? Um, and, and so we're not just looking at pawns on a board. Oh, you have a skill, we'll move you over here. But that person may not want to do that job. So um, how, how do we work on identifying and then making that fit, but again, with an inclusive look moving forward? Yeah, well, again, I think uh, we need to draw from the experience from other transitions, like uh, the OECD, we are working with technology, sat with the Trade and Technology Council, in the, which, is, which is a joint initiative of the United States Department of Commerce and the European Commission. And uh, what they're looking at uh, through the Talent for Growth uh, Task Force is precisely looking at how to increase diversity in the context of a very big uh, skill shortages in the sector. And um, I think there are very good examples there, um, specifically of bringing in, you know, uh, groups that are generally underrepresented in these professions. And it is the case in, in, in the case of gender women, for example, also younger people, as I, I showed you in the statistics. Uh, a lot of it, uh, so there's, there's the two aspects, right? There's the attitude from the employers. And of course, I don't want to point the finger at anybody. Most of the people represented here, in any case, who come from relatively big companies who have very clear, you know, HR strategies, who understand, uh, you know, competence and skills uh, uh, over, you know, uh, qualifications. But the problem is, you know, a lot of employers don't have that mindset. And so they're still reasoning pretty much in terms of qualifications. They they also have a, a stereotyped uh, view of uh, who works in what sector. And so already there's a mindset that's changing, that's addressing stereotype at hiring and so on, having also in place a system um, uh, you know, of, uh, of uh, performance assessment, of internal growth, of career uh, promotion that's related to skills and not to qualifications. So that's the first step. And I think that step is 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 facilitated <laughs> for if anything can come out that is positive from that this global situation of shortages is facilitated by the shortages so you know now everybody needs talent so they are open to try anything so i think there is that goodwill from the side or from the demand side 
On the supply side, I think there is uh, actually what's uh, turning out to be particularly successful are, as the question suggests, all those initiatives that reach out directly to these groups and uh, reach out to them, uh, empower them to some extent. I think uh, for the technology sector, I have not... Uh, uh, sense uh, that the reaction has been why would I work there because that's not my typical uh, my typical area I mean the place where I would look for work or the sector where I would look for work the reactions being rather oh I can do that I did not know that I could do that so it's more a feeling of empowerment I think so this idea that we may find ourselves in front of a wall because these workers are not interested in working in green sectors, I think might be misplaced. Uh, but but I certainly think that, you know, you need outreach. A lot of the programs we've looked at for diversity in the technology sector are really run by associations, by, um, you know, non-profits, organizations, training providers that go out, uh, uh, sensibilize the, 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 the population to, to, to the new sector from a young age, uh, through you know short internships, for example, uh, that then encourage them to pursue careers in the sector or bringing in specific groups and retraining them if they are unemployed or inactive. So, I think we do have the means, and maybe the the you know the the context is right uh, ripe <laughs> to try them. I'm going to combine the next a couple of questions here that I really like and in. Focus on how education plays a role moving forward in this. And if we're looking at skills that you can identify today that are required, well, those skills are going to evolve over time. And um, Glenn, if you mentioned it, Adam, you've touched on this as well. Is when we're looking at education, but not education for someone in my situation, but looking at my children's, that's a long term investment and plan for people that may not hit the job market for 20 years. How can you plan with you know, education, governments, companies to look at that? What are those skills that can be can be uh, fostered over time in order to get us to some future place? And and the second part of that question is with the disruption of the green transformation transition, along with the other the digital as well. How many jobs do you see disappearing in this? And of course, you can't predict what may actually what we're going to create in the future, but do you see a, a, a big drop off of existing jobs? So these people, we may be left with people looking around going, I don't know if I have the skills, but there's no job here for me. Um, it's kind of a two part question there, but that education link, which is long-term and then sort of more of the immediate skilling to fill roles that may be vanishing as well. I don't know if uh, who wants to take a crack at that one first, Adam? Sure. I mean, I'm probably not the, the greatest expert on this call around policy, but I mean, I'll give you a business view. I mean, I have a nine year old son and, you know, it astounds me how much, you know, I, I went to his school the other day and, you know, a separate conversation. But, you know, um, they were doing a presentation on responsible AI and I was like blown away by the fact that they're talking about that in school and the use of, of AI. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm sure not every school is like that. I, I think you know, educational reform is paramount. You know, we we still, you know, accelerate individuals based on credentials of education, right? And fundamentally, what is that? Your ability to memorize, and I'm being really controversial, but um, are you building skills? You know, are, are kids having discussion on humanities and actually getting rewarded and um, developed based on their ability to show empathy and communication and relatability? Um, I think these are huge development areas for education, but I, I think business need to play a huge role in that, Andrew, of like, you know, and, and I think skills is going to help that. And probably, you know, you can see Glenda and I are pretty aligned on this. At the moment, we've been looking at job function and title, and it wasn't easy to translate that back into curriculum, right? But now if we're looking at assessment of hard and soft skills, it's going to be easier, hopefully, and it will take a lag in time to do that. But, you know, I'm optimistic that business needs to drive, you know, the transition of, you know, work readiness from very, very early in career development, from coding to human skills. And actually that needs to change ultimately, you know, how people are certified. And, and maybe the degree becomes less important because, you know, I'm now, what, 40, mid 40s. No one really cares if I've got a degree. They care what skills I've got, right? 
Um, I, I think on the job losses concern, I think that's a question that comes with any transition. I, I, I would say it's a very black and white view of the world. I think, I think we can't forget that we don't have enough people to do the jobs. We probably don't have the right people. Um, and I think this is what this is about. You know, of course, there is going to be people impacted. And, and maybe that's around mindset that people just don't want to change. You know, you could look at AI as a great example. The, the biggest threat to jobs is not machine. It's, it's human and machine. You know, people's ability to focus on the human and strategic and then be enabled by world class tech that drives opera, uh, optimization, performance and efficiency. And it's going to be the same within green skills. You know, once people start to realize that there's equity in learning skills and actually there's more um, transparency around the purpose and the role people can play in a very, very important agenda transition item, um, governments, education companies have to then support people's, you know, shift. But I think this is less about jobs going away. It's actually trying to bring up the in headlights the importance of how quickly your job is going to shift on you um even if you're not shifting jobs right and i think that's where people have to be clearly understood that it's not it's not the government or my company's job for me to evolve at pace it's my job and i think that's where a lot of individuals now they don't necessarily need training they want a company that can enable them to fulfill their career and skill goals and I think that's the modernization of like how I would view that. Let me get to one last question for Glenda before we wrap up. But Adam, you made me laugh because my my six year old the other day came home from school saying, "Oh, I was telling my friends what mom does for a living, but I have no idea what you do. I don't know what your <laughs> job is." So I ended up describing it to her in skills, and then she understood that a bit better. So that made me laugh. Exactly. That, uh, yeah. The title. I have happen. the inverse problem. Uh, <laughs> generally, my kids say, "Oh, that is easy," but I can never say what you do. <laughs> Uh, Glenda, finally, just to to wrap us up and bring us back to the work of the WEC as well, just from your opinion, what policies are needed to smooth this transition with skills? And what role would the HR service industry be able to play? I mean, what policies can help our industry uh, uh, move this along and, 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 and empower people uh, in their skill development? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it links well with, I won't repeat the things that Adam has said about education, maybe just one point that, you know, we need to teach young people to be resilient. I mean, we hear these uh, crazy numbers about how many, uh, what percentage of jobs we don't, we don't know yet that will be created in the future. So I'm not going to spit out another of these numbers, but still, um, I, I think that's partly true. I mean, in the sense that young people will find themselves moving around a lot more than we did in our career. So it's important that we teach them to learn, learn to learn and sort of learn to reinvent themselves and have the means then to continue to learn later. So that's something additional uh, to what Adam was saying. But I think your question links directly to the other uh, points. So there will be some sectors losing out. We think in net terms, you know, it, it the transition like the digital transition as well will end up being a net growth in terms of employment but still there'll be losers and winners and so you need to have in place uh, policies uh, to help the losers basically uh, those who are likely to lose their jobs that's what I mean and uh, I think that um, uh, you know, anything to do with re-employment, of course, uh, uh, public and private employment services is very important. Uh, there will be, of course, a role also for social security systems, because for some workers, it's going to be extremely difficult to become re-employed. But I think for many of them, again, taking this skills lens, the re-employment is possible. So uh, again, pub public and private employment services that will focus on retraining and I think in terms of training what's emerging very clearly for us uh, is this tendency to have more flexible um, uh, training available flexible in terms of the uh, you know modular nature the length uh, the place and the time at which the training is delivered uh, th this way we can already start training before people lose their jobs so workers are facilitated in participating 
coaching and training, which normally uh, is complicated by the fact that they like the time uh, uh, to, to train. This is what most adults tell us. So I think the provision of training that's targeted to specific needs and also perhaps the uh, the assessment of where the skill gaps are, and also a third component, which is more from the policy point of view than from the WEC point of view, is, you know, can we have systems that recognize skills that being acquired through experience, but might not be, uh, you know, easily represented through qualifications, uh, particularly for the low skill, and I, I show you that's one of the groups for which the transitions are going to be the most complex, um, is, is a very important element. But I think for the for the private employment uh, um, industry point of view, I think really assessing skill gaps and being able to address the skill gaps through short modular training is the is the best solution, both in terms of uh, retraining adults who don't want to go back for four or five years to get another degree, but also in terms of responding rapidly uh, to needs by companies who are facing uh, skill shortages, which might mean loss of productivity, loss of competitiveness. Excellent. And right on time. So thank you very much, Glenda, Adam, for joining us today. Thank you to all of our participants online for your questions as well. Please look forward uh, to an email from us with some of the attachments that we discussed earlier. And if you have any further uh, questions about this session or future sessions coming up, please don't hesitate to contact us or contact me here as well if you have questions about this session. But uh, once again, thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, and we'll see you soon.